So yeah, um, thanks for the introduction. I'm Klaus. I've been working on the actual consensus part of blockchain since a very long time. I started in 99, worked on my PhD on it, nobody cared, so I left the area for something more interesting. Worked on privacy, critical infrastructures, and um, now I'm back working with Vega Protocol, which is a um, decentralized uh, trading platform for derivatives, but I'm not talking about Vega. I am talking about the blockchain layer and some of the problems that blockchains that are on the blockchain layer that are affecting all the higher applications, but they need to be solved down in the plumbing department. And I want to talk about you how we can solve this and uh, what that means for you. So first of all, why do we need this? So it's validator policies. Why do we need policies for our validators and miners? When Bitcoin started, we had this very brief period of romantic idea of thousands of grad students sit in their dorm rooms and when they don't play computer games, they secure Bitcoin and everything is great and all these thousand people make sure Bitcoin works. And that worked for a while, it worked great, it got Bitcoin to where it is now, so it was a very nice phase, but it's not modern reality now. Modern reality is mining or validating, it's a very serious business. If I now want to go into it, I have no chance because I don't have the money. So now Bitcoin, Ethereum, all of this is actually run by more or less serious companies. And that did change the setting. That um, means that some assumptions that we had when thousands of black students idealistically ran something called Bitcoin, nobody heard about. Um, what was true back then uh, just doesn't hold anymore. Um, and some problems, so one of the things that we want is diversity. Some problems we see we don't have that now. Uh, about a year ago, 70% of all the world's mining capacity for Bitcoin was in China. So luckily China solved this by saying, you guys out, and use too much energy. If they had said, you guys out and leave your mining rigs here, then Bitcoin would be dead. Then the Chinese government would have 70% of the mining power and there would be no Bitcoin anymore. So I'm very grateful they did it the way they did, but somehow relying on the Chinese government to keep your highly decentralized infrastructure running does not seem to be a very good approach to what we want to do. Um, somebody mentioned uh, Amazon before. If you look at Solana, 37% of all the Solana validators uh, use Amazon Cloud Services because it's great. If I want to start a validator, I don't use the hardware, I go to cloud, I look up the cloud where it works. So Amazon controls almost 30% of uh, Solana validators. If the gov US government says we have a problem with Solana, they give Amazon a call and Zumana is gone. Um, East 2 early test nets, so there the problem was everybody was running the same code, but in the code, 75% of the miners went down, um, it stopped. Uh, and last thing that uh, thankfully the American government is now also advertising um, our technology approach. Uh, the SEC decided half of the EC, or most, there are more uh, Ethereum validators in the US than anywhere else in, in any other country. So Ethereum is here by a US citizen. Um, yes. But that's not true. Um, they are not in the United States. No. I don't know if it's true. It's what the US said. So. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it does show centralization, lack of diversity is a very dangerous thing for blockchains. And there's a very natural tendency to go to diversity. So with the China thing, it wasn't bad intent of anyone. It was just they have cheap energy. and. Uh, the people that built my rigs are nearby. So it was just very natural economy of scale price optimization. We ended up in a world that we also decentralized, but actually then uh, was very centralized. Um, now, if you want to change this, one fine controversy, and we don't have time to discuss this now, is if I want diversity in geolocation, of course, validators can lie. So we had huge discussions. If I want to have policy in like, uh, they have to be spread over the world, if I can't reliably find out where validator is, should I still enforce a policy? Um, I would say yes, I have locks on my door, even though I know people that can fix them, but just because my locks aren't perfect doesn't mean I should have any lock. Uh, um, I shouldn't have any, but it's a discussion that is important to have. Should we only try to uh, apply things that we can enforce 100% or we can't, but at least uh, honest people will be diverse if we put in geographic policies. Um, the second big thing in validator policy is called uh, MEV or front running. Um, anyone here knows what that is? Anyone here does not know what it is? 
the rest is too, rest is too shy. So front running essentially means if I run a validator, I see transactions before they are on the chain. So um, I see this guy is selling IBM for 99 bucks. I see this lady is buying IBM for 100 bucks. I say, great, I put my transaction in between, buy your IBM for 99, sell it to you for 100, I have made a buck. That otherwise would have gone to you. Um, there's some more complex things, uh, but that's the basic idea. And um, yeah, the damage done by front running or the fee extracted by miners, so they don't call it theft or bribery, they call it extracted value. But the money that is extracted from traders um, has been up to 12 billion in a day, which I find sort of hard to believe, but it's, it's staggeringly high amounts whether you believe the graph or not. Um, so one of the basic uh, business models of miners and Ethereum is no front running. It's even got organized now. And this is your money. That, so in addition to the gas fee, also your money in trading, some of this ends up in front running, which is becoming a big problem, especially <coughs> if you want to run a trading platform and make your traders happy and tell your traders not to go to a centralized exchange where the problem exists too, but uh, I think not quite that big anymore. Um, there's other policies, so we then had academics starting to find out what are the main policies that we want. Um, build axioms, this is what everybody wants, therefore that's the policies we need. And um, we came up with other axioms that contradicted the first axioms, so the main message there is it's tough, we don't really know what we need, or what we want, so it's beyond the academic research and this is obviously what everybody wants. So apart from the two things I mentioned, this is now homework for you. Uh, if you could implement any more policy on miners, what do you want? What do legal people want? What do economists want? Um, we can have a discussion later over a beer. I'm just sticking to the two things I just mentioned. Um, so the first uh, idea, if you want to implement a policy, and that's, for example, what Ethereum does, does by slashing miners, is we do an economic policy implementation. You behave good, we give you more money. Um, so you are diverse, you build your validator in Australia rather than the US, you get more reward. Um, you misbehave, we slash your reward. Our delegated proof of stake is doing this indirectly. Um, people delegate you to be a validator. If you misbehave, we take their money away, so they will vote you out. Um, and for MEV, the idea is essentially, well, the money gets stolen anyhow, so at least organize the people that take it, and um, then it's us and not them. Oh. Still don't, don't quite understand how that works. Um, so this is the easiest approach to solve this. Um, if you want to implement policies, so that's equivalent to tax breaks, make tax breaks, people do what you want. Um, and now I'm missing a slide. Um, the slide should have been why this is problematic. Uh, one reason why this is problematic is I have a lot of policies uh, and in the end only uh, one financial gain. So what do I do if I want to reward performance and geography? The guy in Australia is also slower than other people, so suddenly I take money here, give money there, it doesn't really work. Uh, the main thing we ran into is that we actually, we always assume there's a very easy business model for validators. They validate and they get money. It turns out a lot of validators actually have a totally different uh, business model than you expect. Some live off front running, so that's like if the local police force lives completely on bribery, then giving someone a salary raise for being a good policeman doesn't really help because it's not the salary they are after, it's a bribery. Um, other things we found, there are validators that work with custodians, so they actually are much more happy that the custodian they work with makes money than uh, them making money. Um, also blows up some economic incentive schemes, and then also partially also our own fault. We are building a derivative market, so if I put in economic punishments for bad behavior, people can then put on a derivative to sell the risk. So suddenly if I slash a validator, the validator says, oh, you've just slashed all the people that bought my derivative, not my problem. I've worked for centralized banks, works here too, so um, economic incentives can work, but they have some limit on uh, how far you can, you can drive this. And this is why we're thinking about putting um, policy on the consensus layer and see how far we can drive this. Um, now, first warning, this is sort of a warning slide about everybody who messes with the consenting layer, it's hard. Um, this is a paper from uh, 1994, and as you see in the title, it's actually proves that consensus isn't even possible. 
And this paper is correct. So in 84, it was proven what we're doing now is technically possible. They actually got the best paper award for this. It's a very celebrated work. Um, so the end. Um, not quite, because in crypto, as in Texas, if you're really careful and you know what you're doing, you can get around certain things, but better be very, very, but that's a, actually a very Gibraltar slide, I guess. Um, so you can get around certain things, even around possibility results sometimes, but you have to do it very, very carefully. And anybody who relies on either of those books, um, nothing against the authors, I haven't even read them, but uh, please don't do business based on uh, cryptography for dummies. Um, so yeah, it is complicated, but we got around these results. This is sort of the map of different ways people got around it. What's important for, for this context is actually uh, all the ways it got around it have a limit on how many corrupt validators we can tolerate. So the whole idea of having many validators is some of them can be evil, can crash, the whole system still works. Depending on how I get around this result, it's either I need to assume two server honest, and then I'm relatively independent on network timing, or with the enormous chain that Bitcoin introduced, 51% need to be honest, but then I also need the network to be half very reliable timing-wise. So this is actually are the two main things I need now, the two third and the 51. So all consensus algorithms, either if more than uh, one third of the validates are dishonest, or for Bitcoin or the old Ethereum 51, then bad things happen on this chain. And this is where we get all our limits from. Now, if you look into the actual code, and I think that's the last time I show code, so um, I guess it's not the kind of audience that uh, likes, actually the second last time I code, this later too. Um, so you see actually those thresholds in the code. And what we started seeing, is, well, what does it actually mean? Why is it a third? Actually, and it's also a question for my management, like why can't you be better than a third? Come on, be better, beat the math. Um, and what the third actually means, so here it's written as, as 2f plus 1, so that it's uh, honest people is uh, twice uh, allowed dishonest people. What that really means is this is a set that has an honest majority. And if you look at essentially every single consensus algorithm that's used these days, um, there are these three thresholds, n being the number of total validators, t is the number where you want to, uh, that you want to tolerate <laughs> being corrupted. And we only have these three thresholds, and what they actually mean is, if I say t plus 1, what I really mean is this is a set where no one guy is honest. So this is a 51% on Bitcoin means um, this is one where no, at least one guy among this 51% was honest because we assume <laughs> Half of them, are, uh, at least half of them are honest. So if, if I talk to 51%, I get one honest input. Um, and I spare you with the details now, but essentially what that means is we can replace thresholds by sets. So you can write down every single set of validators that where I want to say I want to, that to be corrupted. So rather than saying a third of the validators, I can say validators located in a third of my countries. And that now gives me, if you think of a Bitcoin scenario again, if 75% of the validators are in China, they still all can be in, in Chinese hands. I don't care because I say I need a third of the, uh, two thirds of the countries to be honest. If all of China is not, fine, I can live with this. And from then on, again, probably sparing you some details, we can have a, a mathematical formula on when can we still achieve consensus. So what sets uh, still allow us to do something useful. So that gives us a formula, how complex can my policy be, and I still can do useful things. So if I want to say I want to tolerate a third of all countries to go bad, okay, if I want to say a third of all countries plus a third of all cloud providers, maybe okay too. If I say a third of the countries plus a third of the cloud providers plus a third of all implementations, uh, plus a third of all genders running your validator, plus a third of um, all operating systems, uh, then at some point I'm getting into trouble and I can't implement it anymore. Um, which, uh, what it gives us, we have maximum uh, flexibility, we can measure the complexity, we can actually automatically convert all protocols, so this is very nice, we don't need to rewrite everything, we can use it on the stuff we use now. Um, but the discussion now is, given we have a limited complexity we can do, 
what policies do we want? So again, uh, this is something that the tech, tech people shouldn't decide. This is something that should be a community decision. So I think geographic uh, diversity is a very good idea. If we can have one more diversity vector that we can factor in, what do we want? Do we want code? Do we want cloud providers? Um, where should the diversity be in the validators? And that's one of my goals to actually get this discussion running. Um, we can put in diversity, but in a limited way. So what should we focus on? Yeah, good. Um, so second thing, MEV. So what we want to do there is order policy. So we want a policy on which order validators can apply uh, to transactions. Um, and the way we do this is we have a pre-protocol. So this is my little users. This is a pre-protocol. This is a blockchain. And the way almost all blockchains work is and for every block we have one leader that says this is how the block is to be. And that guy makes a proposal and then the others just confirm, look sort of legit and um, there's some back and forth and it's put on the chain. But the leader has total power to say what goes into the block and if the leader just says, I just didn't see that spy entry for IBM, then who, who am I to say they did see it? So they have all the power. Um, so what we do in MEG protection is we put a layer in between where rather than talking to the blockchain directly, I talk to the block generation protocol. And that one needs at least a certain number of validators to have seen the blocks. They say, I've seen the blocks in those order. And if they all agree on this block or this transaction was before that transaction, um, then the leader cannot reorder because they all said here is signed, I saw A before B, so please try to put A before B. And they take the flexibility away from the leader and they can then implement an order policy. So the simplest one is if all honest uh, nodes in here saw my transaction before yours, then my should go first. Um, but you can also do other things if you want to have something like uh, simulate the Syrian gas market. We can also say, unless the other guy paid twice as much gas, so we can even have a sort of mixture. Um, if I pay too little gas, I still, the longer I wait, the higher my weight goes, so I, I don't sit there forever. So again, we are very free in the policy we do. And the main thing is we put something in between to take away the power uh, from the leader. Um, we have implemented this in a test bed yet. Cornell University came up independently with the same idea, has implemented this. So it exists as code, but uh, as far as I know, not yet in any of the major blockchains. And um, yeah, this is going a little bit more in the code, but essentially what I said, so the first thing is dissemination. Uh, all transactions are sent to all the validators, then they say in which order they saw it, and then uh, depending on what they say, there's a certain order prescribed to um, what the leader is allowed to do. Um, I skip this. Um, there's unfortunately some impossibilities that I can get circles. So this is where things gets interesting. So if I have four transactions coming to four validators in this order, then um, my whole thing actually uh, ends up in a paradox. Um, so you're actually going through the whole loop now. Uh, so yeah, there are a couple of uh, things we need to be careful about. There's different ways of, uh, of handling this. Um, this is, again, made mainly saying it's not completely as trivial as it may sound, but I just put someone in between that makes the order. Um, there are solutions to this. So our solution was, if I have such a paradox, I go to li a lower level of fairness. Cornell did a slightly different way. So there are ways around. Um, but we also need to be careful not every policy can easily be implemented. Um, it's not the ma magic bullet. No, nothing is a magic bullet against something as complicated as MEV, but it does give us a chance to have some level of uh, fairness in the blockchain that if I send my transaction first, I have a very good chance that it actually is executed first and that the business model of front running may not go and get, uh, get entirely impossible, but it gets substantially harder. Um, so with the ordering for framework, um, other nice thing is, so coming back to Vega actually, so we run different markets. Different markets may have different requirements for fairness. Some may be highly competitive and you need fairness, and others, they may be so slow that nobody really cares. 
So you can also on the same blockchain have uh, different groups of uh, markets or in Ethereum can different apps that all individually have their input fair but don't need to be fair relative to each other. So you can even run different concepts of fairness, different definitions on different markets on the same chain, which I think is very beautiful. And we can even change the fairness definition. So if you say we have markets that normally doesn't need to be fair, like Bitcoin normally doesn't need to be fair. If I pay you, if somebody else sees this and pays somebody else as a reaction of this, I normally don't care unless we have a Bitcoin crash where I do care. So we could also say we have a market that normally doesn't have fairness unless it gets a high activity, then we implement the fairness protocol and make sure if there's a market rush, then there is no front running. Um, fun thing for the future. So this is actually very new research that nobody has a solution, which is cross-domain MEV. Um, so what happens if I work on different chains? So one example could be we use another chain as an Oracle. So somebody reorders transactions in there to manipulate the price, which then on our chain um, leads to a different market transaction. Um, that's where things get really messy because the front running is happening on another chain than where the damage is. So we can't say we do everything on our chain to protect the traders because um, somebody stole somewhere else. So this is currently very new. We haven't seen this in the wild yet, but it may also be because it's very hard to measure in the wild if people um, work cross domain because the data synchronizing different chains and seeing like, oh, in this chain that was delayed and in that chain that happened, I, I don't think it's really available. So um, this is very hot research, which means the uh, bad guys never sleep. So um, it's good for job security for the good guys, I think. Um, but at least the stuff that is around now, we, we can sort of manage. Um, so parting summary, I managed to beat the pizza, so that's good. Um, so if you have a plain blockchain implementation, um, we can have serious, interests <laughs> if the, uh, serious issues with the interests of the validators and um, whatever is good for the chain, whatever that means, it's usually also not very well defined, it doesn't really align very well. Um, this is usually solved by economic incentivization, but I'm not sure that always works. So that has severe limits. Um, so what we should, uh, are looking at and should uh, look at for more chains, and this is something that um, is work that is good for everybody. So um, this is sort of, if these things work, every chain can use it. And there are, to the best of my knowledge, no patents on it. So um, it's patent-free usable for everybody if that works. Um, we can also put validator policies on the consensus layer. So since we really care about like geographic diversity, we can do on a consensus level. Um, I would find actually really interesting if that would have any effect on the SEC if they say, well, you have a lot of validators in one country, but because they're all in the same country, they have less voting right. Um, if that would do anything to the legal arguments, so I have no idea, I'm not a lawyer, I just would find it an interesting uh, thing to see a sort of, sort of techno-legal co-design to say legally we have this requirement, so can we put this into technology to be legally safe from something? Um, and yeah, both MEV and diversity it can be implemented relatively painlessly, so messing on this layer is always some level of pain, but um, it is doable. Um, there is limits and there should be more discussion than if we have limits both on diversity but also MEV. What is it we actually want? What is the fairness we want in MEV? What is the policies we want? And that should not be decided by technical people that build the blockchain, which is also why I'm standing here talking to wider audiences. This is something where we need a discussion if we put policy on a consensus layer. Um, we need a community to decide a decision on what policies we want, and maybe there's even policies I'm completely missing that I never thought about, that more economic or legal people say, oh, we really need this, this is possible. Um, so the short thing there is uh, we, we should talk about policy. And that's no longer my slide, so thank you anyhow. <laughs>